Good morning. Welcome to Portland Bible Church. I'm Pastor Gary Glennie, and we're meeting currently here at our home in Vancouver, Washington. And so thank you so much for joining with us this morning. Those who are uh, live streaming on Judy Glennie's Facebook page, that's my wife's Facebook page. Uh, so Judy Glennie's Facebook page live, or you can go to the website, portlandbiblechurch.com. And at the top of the home page, it has services. There's a drop-down menu there, and you can go down, and there's a link to YouTube, and we post those immediately after the service, so you can uh, hear any of our services for over the past two years and then some. So uh, thank you once again, those who are listening, those who are here live, and our service, of course, are Sunday morning at 10 o'clock right now at 11.15. We take a little break in between, and then at the end of that uh, time, we have about a half hour where we sing the great hymns of the church. So we appreciate your voices. Come and join with us for fellowship. And I always say that we got some goodies out here in the back. So I know people like to go to church sometimes because they have food. So we do have a little. Uh, so you're certainly welcome to come join us for the smorgasbord, as they used to call it back in Pennsylvania days. And so uh, we've got some things there for you. At any rate, our class is, uh, again, Sunday morning 10 now, 11.15. And then on Thursday, we have class at... Uh, seven o'clock right here same time same station and we're doing the book of ephesians right now we're uh, just been looking at our heavenly home that new jerusalem so that's kind of an exciting thing uh, some people weren't aware of you know where do we go when we go to be with the lord and so we're studying that uh, as part of the introductory material in the book of ephesians where it speaks about heavenly places and so we're going to find out about those heavenly places and uh, so that's our thursday class my wife has a class here on uh, wednesday at uh, two o'clock where they're going through the seven churches and i think just about finished she's wrapping up the last church the church of laodicea in revelation chapter three and so they're going to be doing a new study. So you'll be at the beginning, but you can still get the last little bit of the seven churches as she summarizes and closes that study out. Also, I forgot to mention on Thursday night, after our Thursday night class, we have our prayer meeting and we pray for, oh, about a half hour or an hour, or however long it takes to cover the needs of the saints. So if you have prayer requests, praises, thanksgiving, uh, let us know, give us a call or drop us a line. We'll be sure to include your prayer request or praise or thanksgiving. A couple of announcements I don't want to forget here. We do have our communion service in this first hour this morning. So that's coming up. So if you've got your matzah and your grape juice or your Mogan David, whatever it is that you use, uh, so that you can take the elements at your home and share the communion with us. Also, on June the 28th, coming up pretty soon, uh, we have Jim Myers, Jim and Phyllis Myers, missionaries, two of our missionaries uh, that were over in the Ukraine, and they're going to be here in the area. They're going to be at Manning Bible Church, at Bible Doctrine Church, and at our church, and so we'll have a chance to hear uh, the mission that they had in the Ukraine. So apparently still pastors with all the rubble and destruction over there. People are still teaching the Bible. Just amazing uh, the fortitude and the patriotism of those individuals in the Ukraine. So we'll get an update uh, because uh, he gets he's in contact uh, with the pastors over there. So that'll be a time where we can really find out the truth about what's going on in the Ukraine. So that's Jim and Phyllis Myers, our missionaries to the Ukraine and parts of that part of the world. And that's going to be on the, uh, the 28th on Tuesday evening. So normally we have class on Thursday. We'll still have our Thursday class, but we'll have a special class that Tuesday uh, for Jim and Phyllis because they'll be leaving on Wednesday. We want to make sure uh, to have them come and be a part of our class. Uh, by the way, we have the, uh, uh, always mentioned the Patriot Academy, patriotacademy.com, all things dealing with the Constitution, <clears throat> Declaration of Independence, Bill of Rights, <coughs> pardon me, Founding Fathers, and all those great documents that uh, uh, David Barton has in his museum, just an incredible uh, treasure trove, uh, rivaling probably even better in some respects than what you'll find in the Smithsonian Institute. And uh, he, along with uh, uh, Rick Green, have put together a training, actually several training courses that are going across our nation. I understand over 200,000 people in the country have actually gone through this training. Many trainers out there presenting the Constitution, 
Declaration of Independence. So just an incredible thing. So you can check that out, find out uh, all about it, patriotacademy.com. And then there's a film that we watched and uh, tells us something about the uh, difficulty and the corruption that we believe occurred during that last election in 220. A fellow by the name of Dinesh D'Souza, he's put out a number of uh, films, and this one is called 2,000 Mules. And if you haven't seen it, you need to at least look at it. Uh, you may disagree, but it's certainly something for information, and you won't hear it in the mainstream media, of course. Uh, you can go to SalemNow.com. Salem, just like it sounds, S-A-L-E-M, SalemNOW.com. You can there. I think you can actually view it at the website. Uh, have you viewed it? Some of, some of us have viewed it at the website. So you can do that. And... Uh, the last thing I have, and I mention this periodically, is that we have a number of books. We haven't given them all out yet. Uh, this is one I just reordered. This is called uh, Isaiah 53 Explain, and it's a tremendous tool to witness to your Jewish friends because it presents the Messiah, the best passages conceivable in the Old Testament or in Isaiah uh, 52. Uh, 13 to Isaiah 53, 12. And so in those passages, the explanation of the Messiah is just crystal clear. Not only that, but it's also a good read for those of us uh, Gentiles uh, to understand how the Messiah was presented in the Old Testament. People often say, well, where is Jesus in the Old Testament? Well, among other places, it's right here in Isaiah 52 and 53. We've also noted about 22 Psalms that are messianic, of course, many of them pertaining to both the first and or second advent of the Messiah. The other one that we talk about from time to time, when we were studying the doctrine of leadership, uh, we looked at uh, this concept of freedom through military victory. This was put out by a fellow by the name of uh, Robert Thiem in Houston, Texas, many years ago. It's a compilation of a number of his publications. Uh, this one presents, of course, as we noted before, all the principles of leadership that we taught here a few months ago, and of course other things that are involved, just basically uh, the divine institutions that are the laws that God has designed, such as gravity, which would be a physical divine uh, provision, but there are spiritual divine provisions such as free will and marriage and uh, nations and all the things that we find in Genesis that are for all members of the human race, not just for believers. So the principles of establishment are found here. Just a tremendous treatment. We've gone through some of that. So if you want either of those, we have them available here for you, or you can get them uh, uh, by giving me a call, and we'll be sure to send them out to you free and postpaid. Somebody asked me the other day, I said, we don't sell anything. We give everything away uh, because uh, grace is free. It's the fact that God has provided everything through Jesus Christ on the cross, so we have nothing to sell, everything to give away. And if you desire to support the ministry of this local church or any grace ministry, that is between you and the Lord. So we encourage you to consider that, but no charge is made for any of these publications. Okay, I think that is all the announcements. And uh, uh, we take time at the beginning of each of our Bible studies, and no exception today, because we'll be taking the elements of communion. And the time that we take for silent prayer is to afford you the opportunity to confess any sins that you're aware of. Now, you may not be aware of them, but one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit, not only to the unbeliever, but particularly to believers as well, is that he convicts us of sin so that we can recognize when we're in sin and therefore not in good fellowship. Doesn't mean we lose our salvation ever, but we can lose the enabling or filling of the Holy Spirit. And the way that we restore that is to confess any sins that we're aware of. In 1 John 1, 9, it reads this way, if we, believers, confess our sins, name them, cite them, agree with God that they're sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, the ones we just confessed. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that picks up the ones that we didn't know about or we just forgot. And so we then have the enabling, we believe, of the filling of the Holy Spirit. Dr. Chafer, in his eight volumes of Systematic Theology, made this concept clear. And many of us follow suit and believe that by confessing sins, we have regained the fellowship status and the enabling of the Holy Spirit whereby we can understand the things of God, the mind of Christ, which is the Word of God. So with that in mind, and in preparation for our study this morning, let us pray.
Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that lives and abides forever. Thank you for your person, the fact that you've created us and you've allowed us to have fellowship, even a relationship with you through the finished work of your son, Jesus Christ on the cross. What an honor it is to have freedom, at least in terms of our soul forever, but freedom in this nation to be able to worship together with those of like mind, to fulfill the command to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. We thank you that you've given us this opportunity. We thank all of those who are here. We pray that we might be edified of soul, challenged and motivated by the things we study. We pray all this in the powerful and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Let my cry come before thee, O Lord, give me understanding according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is truth. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open, if you will, in your scripture to the book of 1 Corinthians. Actually, I want to go to Luke. I was just thinking about it. I had this in, in uh, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is one of the passages we usually go to, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, uh, which is Paul's presentation of the communion service. Uh, but we find it also in Matthew 26, 26 through 30, Mark 14, 22 to 25. But I normally go uh, now to Luke 22. So uh, look at Luke chapter 22, verse 14 to 20. And the reason I've mentioned before is this is the only passage where we see two cups actually spoken of. And uh, obviously the one cup is the cup of redemption, which we believe is the cup that Jesus spoke about and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And it was talking about this third cup of redemption. Uh, we understand there were basically four cups uh, and traditionally, we don't know for sure if there were four cups when Jesus took the Passover and celebrated it with his disciples. No one knows for sure, but uh, in uh, the history since then, many things have been added by way of tradition. We look at some of those traditions because they have come down to us uh, really from the second or third century at the earliest. And so obviously these things were practiced by the Messianic Jews who believed in the Messiah. And of course, the Gentile churches picked them up when they commemorated the, uh, the communion, which is part of the Passover. Uh, we see today, however, that many churches have uh, minimized the communion service into just the cup and the bread and do very little explanation. I have tried to fill in some of the detail of the fact that the communion is part of the Passover celebration. And for a time in Christendom, actually because uh, many Christians were anti-Semitic, we are not. Anti-Semitism is a violation of God's uh, person, I believe. They are his chosen people then, now, and forever. Uh, and they were chosen for the purpose of evangelism. Yes, they failed, but they are still part of the Abrahamic covenant which will be fulfilled in the future we believe and therefore uh, we see that this information that was given to the Hebrew people is for our instruction as well just like at the beginning we mentioned Isaiah 53 52 and 53 the Old Testament of course feeds into the New Testament and we understand the New Testament on the basis of of the Old Testament. We don't force the Old Testament uh, by taking the New Testament and reading backwards. It's the other way around. We have the very blessing. In Paul, fact, Paul said, salvation is of the Jew, recognizing we have no salvation if it's not from the Jewish people because Jesus was a Jew. It's always amazing to me, people who are anti-Semites, who reject Hebrew uh, people and the Jewish people, that Jesus himself was a Jew. I mean, it's just, it's just uncanny, and yet some Somehow, down through the centuries, that has become a, a real problem. So at any rate, we have the passages here, but uh, some things that I wanted to address, of course, when we
when we take the communion, we if you have been with us before, we have our table set up here. We don't have another camera to show you. But on our table, we have, of course, the bread, which is the unleavened bread, matzah. We have the cup, which we believe is unleavened, although some use the Mogan David as wine, as I understand. Uh, and so uh, that have traditionally has gone back and forth, and there are many different p opinions on that. We've opted for the grape juice uh, because of the unleavened nature. Jesus Christ, of course, bore the sin, but he was uh, sinless and then bearing those sins. And so on the table, you see these things. We also have candles, and uh, the candles, of course, represent the eternal light. And so we have uh, the linen tablecloth, which uh, represents purity and righteousness. The um, the feast can be celebrated even by Gentiles and the dispensation of the church because Paul tells us to do it. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8, he says, Therefore, let us celebrate the feast. And the feast he has in discussion is the Passover, uh, not the communion. Communion is what we call it, and that's where we have taken those two elements out of the Passover and addressed them as if they were something separate. They have a separate and distinct function as Jesus augmented the Passover. But the Passover celebration is not just for the Hebrew people because just as they were delivered physically out of slavery in Egypt, so we are delivered uh, spiritually out of the slave market of sin. Then, of course, we have the, uh, the loaves of bread we mentioned and the candles. Usually at the beginning of our service and at the beginning of any of the uh, Hebrew services, including the Messianic services, they always have uh, the candles that are lit. And the candles are lit by uh, the matriarch uh, of the group, the, the, uh, usually the senior lady, if I dare say that, uh, of the group. And she, or, or in the home, it would be the mother. By the way, Passover was generally done in homes, just like we do it here. Uh, today, it's done in churches. But originally, and down through tradition, it's something that was done in the home. And the mother would be the one who lights, lights the candles. And as with uh, many of the parts of the Passover, there are multiple prayers that are given down through the centuries by way of tradition. This is the prayer that is given for the candles. I'm going to have my wife Judy come and she's going to light the candles now and then she will uh, give the prayer for the lighting of the candles, the eternal light here. And I've tried to figure out, I forgot to ask my rabbi friend, uh, he's a Messianic Jew, why there are two candles. Uh, we can see them as the hypostatic union, the fact that Jesus is both God and man. We can see them as the New and the Old Testament, but we really don't know. Usually there are two candles uh, that are lit during every festival, and so we try to commemorate that here as well. Judy? Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brought forth thy Son, thy only Son, Yeshua HaMashiach, to be the light of the world and our Paschal Lamb, that we might live through him. Okay. So that's how we open the service, of course. And uh, the service itself is one of the things that we do in the local church. As I say, some churches minimize it. We try to spend a little more time because the communion itself is a teaching time. It's not just the taking of the elements and rushing through so that we can get to the more important parts of the class. It is a time of teaching. It is a time of commemoration. If you please, it's a time of testing. And the test is this. Can you focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross on your behalf during the time that the elements are being passed without being distracted? That's one of the reasons we do not use music during the time of passing the elements, as some churches do. They need to fill it with music. We believe that that's a time to focus on the unique celebrity of the universe, the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, we will have a little bit of silence, uh, which in terms of broadcasting, as we're doing here, uh, they say that's dead time. But for us, it's the greatest time. It's the time where we reflect on the person of Jesus Christ uh, as we take the elements of the communion. So this is what we do during the communion service. The other things that are part of a local church, of course, are prayer. And we always pray at the beginning and the end of every class. And so uh, also we have prayer during it. We teach on prayer. I was talking to someone just the other day and they said uh, they haven't been in a church where they teach on prayer. That's very sad. One of the main functions of the local church beside fellowship is the teaching of the word of God and then the prayer. Not just communal prayer, but individual prayer, family prayer. It's the way that we talk to God just as he talks to us through his word. And so prayer, 
the breaking of bread or the communion, just the fellowship of being together. The primary time in the local church, of course, is spent in teaching and the inculcation of the word of God. However, there's always a time of evangelism because sometimes unbelievers come into local churches and you can never tell who's listening. So it's always imperative that we give the gospel, that is a pastor acting as an evangelist, to make sure that the gospel is presented clearly to those who might be listening. The communion service itself uh, is many times called the Eucharist, which comes from two Greek words. Actually, eu, which is a prefix, means good, eu, and charis, which means grace. And so it means good grace, and it's translated in thanksgiving. And so when we take the Eucharist or the communion, we're giving thanks to the Lord for what Jesus Christ provided for us on the cross. And so we have this uh, communion called the Eucharist. The conditions, people often say, well, you have to be a member of this church in order to take communion. Uh, you have to be confirmed, all of that. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you come to join with us right now, <clears throat> you are qualified. Uh, one other stipulation is that you make sure that you're in fellowship. So we always take some time, as we noted, uh, for silent prayer to give you that opportunity to confess any sins that you're aware of so that you be sure that you're in fellowship. So we did that at the beginning of our class and hopefully we're all <laughs> in fellowship. Fellowship. If, by the way, sin comes into your mind or some thought, uh, confess that immediately as you take the elements of the communion. So we have these various things. Uh, the purpose I mentioned before is a test. It's a test of our concentration. It's a test of our focus on the person of Jesus Christ. And uh, it is, of course, uh, a physical symbol of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, just as he gave those elements uh, to his disciples, the bread and the cup at that time. So it's what we call a ritual. It's one of the few rituals that we have in the dispensation of the church, the communion service, the taking of the two elements, the bread and the cup. The other is water baptism. Water baptism is done once, and that simply in indicates that you've believed in Jesus Christ. You go under the water, that's sharing his death, uh, positionally, in terms of that uh, picture, that ritual, you come out of the water, which represents the resurrection. And so we have the death, the burial, and the resurrection represented in going under the water, immersion, of course. And so water baptism is done after you've believed in Christ, but it's once. Communion is done periodically. It's reminiscent, of course, of all of the rituals that were fulfilled under the Levitical system in Israel. Literally thousands and thousands of sacrifices, 365 Five days a year sacrifices were made and multiple sacrifices on all the festival days and the Shabbat, the Sabbaths. And so I thank the Lord personally that we have the communion and water baptism. We have two elements that are part of the ritual and the ritual portrays the reality of the person and work of Christ. For the Hebrew people, all of those rituals pointed forward to the fact that the Messiah would come. And so as the writer of Hebrews says, it's done once and for all. There's no further offering for sin because Jesus Christ did it all. He paid for every sin for every member of the human race, and he did it once and for all time. Now, in connection with this, uh, the things that we mentioned in the past, I tried to uh, go back over these because it helps us to remind ourselves of why we take this. The historic reality of Passover is found in Exodus chapter 12, 2 through 28. So if you want to read the complete presentation of the original Passover, Exodus 12, 2 through 28. <clears throat> the Passover signaled Israel's freedom from slavery and oppression from the Egyptians and their pharaoh. The Passover becomes then a type of Christ's death on the cross for our salvation. It's freedom from our slavery to sin and deliverance to a new and eternal life. The communion service, of course, then is the antitype, and it takes the two elements from the Passover, which are the bread and the cup. Now, the bread, of course, we understand Jesus spoke of the bread and said, I am the bread of life. And so the bread certainly represents the person of Jesus Christ. It represents his, his sinless perfection. And so we see that in the bread. Uh, he also said in Luke 6, 35, uh, I'm sorry, Luke, uh, John 6, 35 and Luke 22, 19, he said, this is my body, which is given for you as part of the communion service. So we know that his body and his person are represented, his impeccability by the bread. Then, of course, the cup. 
The cup represents, in a number of places, his death on the cross. In fact, he asked his disciples, he said, can you uh, drink the cup that I must drink? He wasn't talking about the one that was on the table that he was going to pass around. He was talking about what that cup represented. And the cup that he was going to drink uh, was going to be the sins of the entire world. And he would drink that cup fully. And, of course, they would be placed in his person, in his soul, according to Isaiah, in his body. And he became sin on our behalf so that we, by faith in his finished work, could become the righteousness of God in him. And so we have this cup. And we also see that Jesus even asked the Father in his humanity, if it's possible, take this cup from me. Well, he was speaking about the death on the cross. So Jesus himself spoke of the cup as representing what he was going to undergo at the cross. And so we have then this, the cup and a number of significant factors that we've addressed in the past, only by way of review here. The cup, of course, represents the new covenant that God made with Israel. We get to share in that, of course, as part of the church, and we've studied, <clears throat> studied that as well. We're still studying it in the book of Hebrews. So it signifies, of course, the new covenant that God made with Israel and by virtue of our spiritual inheritance with us as well. Secondly, the cup represents the death of Christ on the cross. Of course, we just mentioned that. But one that people don't often realize is that the cup also announces the betrothal of the marriage of Jesus Christ to his bride-to-be. And in ancient Israel, uh, the bridegroom would come and uh, with the bride would drink a cup and this would seal the deal that they were going to be married. They would be betrothed. And sometime later, of course, the marriage would take place. And so the cup kind of sealed the deal, as it were. So when we take the cup, we recognize that we are part of the bride of Christ. And just as the sealing of the deal in ancient Israel in the physical marriage, so we have a spiritual marriage. And just as the bridegroom would go to the father's house and somewhere near it or next to it, prepare a place, and then he would go and steal away his bride. Bride, this is exactly what we see in the rapture of the church. And so we're in waiting. We're a bride to be in waiting. And when our Lord comes, as he says he will in John 14, 1 through 3, when he comes, there'll be a shout and uh, the trumpets and there'll be uh, a lot of noise. And of course, the bride will come down. Uh, probably, uh, I always visualize her coming down the ladder. I don't know if that's true or not. But at any rate, uh, he shouts and she comes out of the house. She's ready to go. And of course, uh, her attendants, her bridesmaid, those uh, faithful virgins in the parable, they will come and uh, join with her and they will go to the, uh, to the wedding ceremony. And so he steals her away and that's how it goes. And so we're going to be taken away by Jesus Christ at the rapture and we go to the father's house, which now has an appendage there, uh, the son's house. By the way, that's the new heavenly Jerusalem we're talking about on Thursday night, so I hope you don't miss that one. At any rate, uh, the marriage takes place, and they usually uh, consummate it for seven days. And the uh, uh, best man is outside waiting, and finally, after seven days, the bridegroom comes out and shouts, it's consummated. And uh, everybody starts cheering, and then they get ready to have the marriage supper, uh, which uh, would be uh, like the uh, uh, festival that we have. What do you, I can never remember what you call it. After the wedding, you have a... Uh, what is it? A reception. I don't know why I can't remember that name. I keep thinking wedding feast. So the reception, which is where, of course, uh, we have all the Old Testament saints and resurrection body and just a wonderful time. And then the millennial kingdom begins. So uh, this idea of the communion has multiple facets to it. And simply drinking that cup causes you to recognize that you are a member of the bride of Christ waiting for your bridegroom to come. So those are facets that we have mentioned before. Hopefully they are uh, still significant in your mind. Jesus Christ is called our Passover in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. He is our Passover. Uh, he has... Uh, 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 he has borne the sins of the entire human race, and uh, this we find in multiple passages, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, uh, and other passages we've studied these. And once and for all time, this is the essence 
of the writing of Hebrews, he talks about Christ's death once and for all time, replacing all of the Old Testament sacrifices. But the real key to it is Jesus rose from the dead, and uh, after the Sabbath, he rose from the dead, and therefore indicating that the Father was satisfied that all the sins of the human race had been paid for and judged. And we see in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 and 23, that Jesus Christ is the first fruits of resurrection. So we have the fact that he is our Passover, uh, he is unleavened bread because he said, I'm the bread of life. And so when we take the bread, Jesus Christ is represented by that unleavened bread. And he is the first fruits. These are the first three of seven feasts of Israel that we have taught in the past. And so the connection with all of these things, I believe, is significant. Now, the thing that we added last time, and I want to go through to this morning, is something that my wife got for me. And this is what's called a setter plate. Uh, Seder plate or Seder plate and you see here that it has these compartments I don't know if you can see it very well I'll try to put it here and you probably can't read the Hebrew on there because it's written in Hebrew but for those who are here with us I've made a uh, handout which has these same six uh, places where you can put different materials and so we're going to talk about that but this is a Seder plate that could actually be used as a traditional part of the Passover by Messianic Jews, those who believe in Messiah, and also the traditional uh, uh, Hebrew people, even for their own Passover. So they look at this as a way of commemorating the Passover. So if you have before you that handout, or you can go online to the charts and graphs, and you can look it up, and you'll see there that we have this, this Seder plate. And uh, this is the handout. I'll hold it up here so you can see it. And uh, so here's what it looks like. And so you can go to the website in the section on charts and graphs, and it has this there, and it kind of explains it. We'll go through it. Uh, this is by request because I talked about it last time, but I was just trying to tell people, uh, put a circle on a paper and then another circle. And so somebody said, I'd like you to go through it again. So we're going to do that again this morning. We're going to look at the Seder plate here as it is used traditionally in the Hebrew Passover, as well as by the Messianic Jewish people who have accepted Jesus as their Messiah. And so we're going to go through, as we take the elements this morning, we're going to go through as if we were doing the entire uh, Passover celebration. It takes a long time. They have a lot of hymns that they sing, psalms, basically, uh, and they also have multiple prayers. You remember we had uh, my wife Judy give the opening prayer, lighting the candle, but there are many other prayers that are given as well, and we do some of those. So basically, the lighting the candles is the first step. Then they have an, a cup that they, that they take, and they salute, and the cup, of course, the first one is the cup of sanctification. Sanctification is simply thanking God for the meal that's coming because the Passover actually is not just taking of these elements, it is a meal that they shared together. And so the first thing that they did, of course, uh, was to give thanks for the cup uh, and, this, uh, and for the meal, and that was the first cup. Actually, there are four cups that uh, the traditional Hebrews use, and they, each one is significant. The information of the four cups, as they use them traditionally in the uh, synagogue even today uh, are these they're found in Exodus 2 24 through 25 and chapter 6 6 through 8 I'll just give you a brief on this so that if you want that's Exodus 2 24 through 25 and Exodus 6 6 through 8 and we have there the four things and they're spelled out you can go back and check them the first cup represents uh, the bringing out of the Hebrew people from Egypt, the bringing out. That's that first cup, the cup of sanctification. At least that's what they explain as they take that first cup. The second cup, which we'll come to a little later, uh, will, of course, uh, indicates the fact that he will, he, uh, that he will uh, rescue them from their bondage. So it refers to the rescue that God does of the people that are in bondage. So the first cup is simply the bringing out, and then the actual rescue process is the second cup. Interestingly enough, the third cup is uh, the cup that says, uh, I will redeem you. 
So when we speak about redemption, it's more than simply bringing them out of slavery. It's more than simply rescuing them. It's the fact that they are redeemed. And redemption, of course, is explained quite uh, in some detail in the New Testament as the fact that we are born again. We are redeemed from the slave market of sin as we understand it by the work of Christ. And so that third cup, the cup of redemption, interestingly enough, is the cup we believe that Jesus took and said, this is the new covenant in my blood, the cup of redemption, interestingly enough. Now, when we are looking at Luke, we see two cups, possibly the first cup, the cup of sanctification, or even the second cup, which would be, uh, in this case, uh, the one that describes the teaching related to the actual celebration of the Passover and what happened with Israel as they uh, were taken out by God of Egypt. And then the fourth cup at the end of the meal. At the very end of the meal, they have a, a cup at the uh, close, and that says, I will take you as my people. And so it has the idea that Israel are the people of God, and he says that he will take them as his people. And of course, once they came out of uh, Egypt, eventually uh, they became the nation of Israel. They received a constitution, as we understand it, uh, on uh, Pentecost on Mount Sinai. Many believe that's the day when they received the law just in the same way as the dispensation of the church began on Pentecost. So Israel received its constitution. Our constitution is written in our hearts by God. And so we see that these things have significance both in the Old, as they call it, and New Testament. Uh, generally speaking, when we talk to a Hebrew person, we don't talk about the Old and New Testament. We speak about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant that God gave to Jeremiah and Jesus Christ ratified when he shared it with his disciples. And so the first thing that they do then is they have the hand washing. You remember that in the uh, upper room time when Jesus shared with his disciples, they had the foot washing. Well, actually, it was a time of hand washing and Jesus upped, it, uh, upped the ante really and he said uh, he took the towel and the basin and began washing their feet. Normally they would just wash their hands but he took time to wash their feet and you've studied that probably in the past. So uh, he augmented the actual Passover where the hand washing occurred. And then we have something called the dipping of the parsley. And so if you look at your Seder plate you'll see that down on the left side at the bottom it says parsley. And so it's this compartment. There are two little pieces of parsley. Uh, they represent the hessop. Uh, they are symbolic, symbolic of what they use to mark the doorposts, uh, the lintel and the doorposts uh, in Israel when they were going to have the death angel come by and take away the firstborn. And the Hebrew people would to take the blood and use some hessop, uh, which kind of is like a paintbrush. Uh, and it's also something that has a cleansing property. It has a fragrance and a cleansing property. You'll remember the same thing is true when Jesus was offered the sour mash that it was put on some hessop as they put it up to his lips. So even this has significance for us as believers. And of course, this cleansing herb uh, in the Hebrew, it's called the karpas, uh, karpas, which is the parsley. So that's on one of these little plates that we see, and that's done next. So the blood on the doorpost, if you want, that's in Exodus 12, 21 and 22. And then it's paralleled in John 19, 29 and 30. And basically what they do is they take the parsley and they dip it either in salt water or in uh, vinegar. Uh, the different traditions do it differently. You know, vinegar is okay, but it's uh, so not something you like to just take by itself. Uh, you know, oil and vinegar on a salad is fine, but vinegar by itself uh, is a little, little nasty. And so the idea here is to recognize uh, the tears of slavery and so the salt water or the vinegar represents the tears of slavery and uh, also the uh, the water salt water would represent the Red Sea and so we have all these things represented here and so sometimes they'll use a, a little bit of uh, lettuce I'm told, and they put it in the vinegar, and this indicates, again, the bitterness of slavery. So the dipping of the parsley or uh, using the lettuce, whatever, all of this is indicating the uh, bitterness of slavery. Then they go to the bread, the matzah, and as we see the matzah, we have here 
we have the flat bread. You can see the flat bread. We, this is unleavened, therefore it does not rise. And we noted the significance many times. Of course, it has tiny little holes in it. You can't see them very well here. But if you have your own matzah, you can hold it up to the light, and you can see right through it. The holes pierce it. We see these as the nail prints of Jesus Christ uh, and his hands, his feet, and his forehead, and even his side where he was pierced with the spear. We also see on some sides you can see almost looks like stripes. And of course Peter tells us by his stripes we are healed. This has to do with the spiritual healing, the regeneration. So the bread is significant. And the bread, of course, I don't have time to develop all of this today because we've done it before, but actually the bread is taken and placed inside of a linen cloth like this. And the linen cloth then is placed inside of a pouch. And the pouch actually is placed into a separate pouch. This is traditional, of course, and not definitely necessary today, but it certainly is something that is interesting to us. So there are three pouches. The one in the center, of course, uh, is called the uh, pouch of redemption, interestingly enough, where this particular piece of bread goes. Then there are two others where you put matzo, and some call those the, uh, the uh, uh, double portion. Some call them the... Uh, the Father and the Holy Spirit. Uh, so there are many different explanations for these, but they're all put into the uh, into the pouches together. And so what they do is they hide this away. They hide it away somewhere in the house, probably under a seat somewhere where it's not not totally visible. And then uh, they take this and uh, they break the middle piece. So they go in here before they put this up. They take it and they break that middle piece. And I am told that they break one piece smaller than the other. And the piece that is larger is what goes into the pouch. Uh, and, of course, they share this piece among themselves at that time. But uh, they're going to wait and leave that, and they're going to come back to it later. This is what the rabbi that I discussed, uh, the uh, Messianic rabbi, explained to me. And he said uh, they do it differently many times, but these are some of the traditions. But they all point to the same thing, this person who is going to be represented by the bread. And so the smaller piece then, of course, uh, is the uh, piece that is later going to be uh, the resurrection of Christ, and so that's with the body that is broken and given to the disciples. So from that point, they go through the story of Passover in Exodus 12, and those four questions are asked. Uh, first of all, why is this night different from other nights? And of course, uh, this is explained by the Father. And then they ask why the unleavened bread, and they explain that because it's the bread of haste, because they're going to get out of town, get, get out of uh, Egypt, you see. And then why do they have the bitter herbs? And the bitter herbs, of course, represent the bitterness of slavery. And then why do they dip it in the salt water? Uh, and that's, of course, the tears that they shed in slavery. And finally, uh, why do we eat only reclining to the left? which is something that's certainly been added. And the rabbi explained to me, I didn't know why this was so, but they say that they lean to the left, uh, which would, you know, I'm leaning to the left, and that's because you would uh, drink the cup with your right hand normally, so you would recline, and you're reclining to the left. Isn't that interesting? And so uh, because most people are right-handed, I suppose if you were left-handed, you'd lean the other way. I don't know. At any rate, at this point, they go and they do the... the uh, the horseradish or the maror, and they dip it, uh, they dip into the horseradish. That's the one at the very bottom. If you have your page there, you can see the horseradish, the bitterness of slavery. And what they do is they take this and they dip it uh, together into a mixture called the coroset, which is apple, cinnamon, nuts, wine. And uh, this represents the clay and the mud of the bricks that they had to use uh, to make the bricks in slavery, and that's the Choroset. And a fellow by the name of Rabbi Hillel, uh, Hillel means praise, by the way, Rabbi Hillel suggested that they take the matzah and they dip it in the horseradish, 
and then they dip that into the Coruscant, and they make kind of a, what's called today in Hebrew society, a Hillel sandwich. Two pieces of matzah with horseradish and the Coruscant. And, of course, this is what they do, and it represents, of course, the slavery, the making of the bread, of the bricks, and so forth, and the uh, sorrow that they had. So all of this tradition, it is interesting. Obviously, uh, I don't know that Jesus did any of this, but traditionally these things have been added in commemoration. Keep in mind that we take the communion service to commemorate his death on the cross just like they did, and they take the Passover, all of these things. Now, the second cup is called the cup of judgment. And the second cup is the cup of the plagues, and they go through and actually list each of the, each of the, uh, each of the judgments of slavery, the ten judgments, down to the death of the firstborn. And of course, then they drink, as we said, leaning to the left, which is a symbolism of freedom, because if you can recline, uh, you're not running for your life. So they recline to the left, representing freedom. And, of course, uh, I've suggested something. I don't know how true it is. You read Hebrew from right to left. So from the right to the left rather than left to right. So you go from the right hand of the scriptures in Hebrew to the left hand. We read our books the other way, but they go from right to left. So I added that in. Then there's this shank bone. The shank bone at the top uh, represents, of course, the, uh, represents the, the uh, burnt offering. I forgot to mention the egg. They also eat an egg. And I always was troubled about the egg. Why do they have an egg? I thought they did that because of people add eggs to, to Resurrection Sunday and call it Easter. But actually, the egg is roasted and then cut up and eaten. And it, to me, represents the peace offering because the peace offering in Israel, they all participated. On the other hand, uh, with the uh, bone, the shank bone, course represents the burnt offering which is the total holocaust offering of jesus christ all that's left there is the bone and so that's put on the plate the shank bone of the lamb representing the uh, burnt offering the zora and the uh, egg is baitza and that's the festival offering i believe the peace offering so what do we have left basically we've covered everything that's on the plate and so we see then one more washing of hands. Perhaps this is the one where Jesus took and washed the feet, although I think it might have been the earlier one at the beginning of the meal myself. And so they uh, go on and have the Passover meal. And once the Passover meal is done, they go through the Passover meal. And I always thought that they ate the the. Uh, of the matzah early on, but it's really the last thing that's eaten at the end of the meal. I didn't realize that. And so the uh, the last thing that is eaten is the matzah, and so uh, they look for it. It's sometimes called the afikoman today, which uh, translated refers to uh, the um, thing that is the last, or uh, sometimes we might call it the dessert. <laughs> we think of it as the pièce de résistance, taking the bread at the end, and this is in Luke 22:19. And so, taking of the bread. So at this point, we want to take the bread. So we'll look at our passage here. And so, looking in the uh, book of Luke, we see it says in verse 14, and when the hour had come, uh, he reclined at the table with his apostles and said. Uh, I have certainly earnestly desired to eat this Passover before I suffer. I say to you, I will never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And having taken the cup, this would be that first or second cup, and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. Some suggested that basically he took the uh, the uh, first cup but and second, but he did not take the cup of redemption uh, and actually drink it, although he passed it around. And then it says, having taken some bread, which he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do it in remembrance of me. So at this point, at this point, we will go ahead and have the bread passed around. Uh, we'll keep them till all have obtained, and then we'll partake together. I'll have the deacon pass. Remember, John said in First John, in John one twenty nine, he said, "Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world." And we already noted in John six thirty five and forty eight, Jesus said, "I am the bread of life," and so he took this 
bread, the unleavened bread, as we mentioned. And having explained the significance, he gave a prayer for the bread, and then they all partook. So let's hang on. We'll give a prayer for the bread, and then we'll all partake together. Wait till everyone has it. I'll pray the prayer in Hebrew and then in English as well. Let's pray. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam, hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And Father, we do give thanks for this bread and all that it represents. That is the sinless perfection of Jesus Christ being offered up as the lamb without spot or blemish. We thank you for this and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. And he gave a single command, take, eat. In Luke 22, verse 20, we have the last statement here, and it says, in the same way or in the same manner, the cup, they've added, he took, which is fine. He took the cup after they had eaten. So this is near the very end of the meal. Uh, it's the last thing. So they have the bread. That's the last thing they eat, but then they're going to have the cup. And so uh, this is the third cup. There'll be one more after this, actually. And so this is where he takes the cup of redemption. He took the cup after they'd eaten, saying, this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. This, of course, is the third cup, the cup of redemption. This is the one that Jesus referred to himself. And so we'll do the same thing. We'll give, uh, pass it around till all have obtained, and we'll give a prayer for the taking of the cup, and then we'll drink it all together. If you're watching this, I hope you have your grape juice ready or share it with us. Jesus gave thanks for the cup. Again, I will use the Hebrew prayer and then I will translate. Let us pray. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam borei peri hagafen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. And Father, we give thanks for this cup and all that it represents, the redemptive work of our Savior, your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this cup and all that it represents as we have studied. And as Jesus said, drink from it, all of you. was actually one more cup, and that is the cup that closes the meal, as we noted, that fourth club, cup, <clears throat> and that, of course, signaled the end of the meal. And uh, Jesus, of course, uh, explained more because this is all part of the uh, what we call the upper room discourse, where he explained a great many things. And so uh, we have that. And then there's also the cup of Elijah. Uh, sometimes we discuss that. This is found in Malachi chapter 4. Uh, where the cup of Elijah is left on the table. This didn't happen until the intertestamental period, but from that point forward, they always put a separate place setting and a separate cup 
filled on the table in the hopes that Elijah would come. Well, of course, John the Baptist <clears throat> was a type of Elijah signaling Jesus Christ in his first advent, as he told those who were listening, if you want to think about it, John is uh, the Elijah who has come. But of course, uh, they rejected that, many of them, and therefore Elijah or a type of Elijah will come before the great and terrible day of the Lord during the tribulation of the future. So the cup of Elijah is remaining on the table. And then, of course, they think they... <clears throat> They have a, they sing a hymn, they have the last cup, uh, the fourth cup, and then they go out to the Mount of Olives to pray. And so that concludes our service. Father God, we thank you again for the opportunity of studying these things together, taking these elements of communion as a ritual, and we pray that all that it represents as we take these elements, that we recognize the person and work of your Son, Jesus Christ, on our behalf bearing the sins, who is indeed our Passover. He is our unleavened bread. He is indeed the first fruits of the resurrection. And Father, for that one person who's here this morning without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, we want you to know that God had you in mind when he sent his son, Jesus Christ, into human history to bear the sins of the entire human race. A perfect sacrifice, a perfect true human being, and all at the same time uh, divine because he was undiminished deity. But he became the savior of the world by his death on the cross. And by believing in him and his finished work on the cross, right now, right where you sit in the privacy of your own soul, you can have everlasting life. Won't you do it before you leave? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, thank you again for the opportunity of looking at these elements and taking these elements as we commemorate your son's death until he comes again, we thank you for these things and pray it in Christ's mighty name. Amen.